Hi, welcome to How to Talk to Your Doctor About Diabetes. This is a free webinar. I'm Mr. Divabetic Max Zedek from divabetic.org, and I'm co-presenting today's webinar with Brian. Hi, everybody. My name is Brian Pongrass. Don't worry about the last name. Just call me Brian. I am a nurse and a nurse practitioner, but I always like to say that I'm a nurse first. Uh, and I will be the medical expert talking to you about your diabetes today. So I've been on the receiving end of quite a few conversations about diabetes, and welcome to go to webinar web events. Made welcome to go to webinar web events made easy. Always has to still be a nurse. Um, but a nurse practitioner is very similar to a doctor. A nurse practitioner gives a Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. Um, they can bill just like a doctor, and a nurse can't. But I don't want anybody to think that nurses can't do a lot. Nurses actually make a lot of assessments. Uh, they just can't order things. So they have to trick the doctor into telling what they want. And we definitely want to order everyone right now to write in your questions as we're doing this webinar because Brian and I agreed that we will answer questions throughout the presentation as they come up and uh, even if they're not related to the topic. That's so let us know right now if you're, on the, if you're on the webinar and we're excited to have you here. You know that the second webinar we're presenting with Clinton Labs, I'm so excited. And if you want more information about either one of our organizations, you could go to divabetic.org or you could go to clinicalabs.com. All right, so uh, this is my slide about DivaBetic. We're a national nonprofit organization. We've got a lot of new things coming up. Just so you know, at the end of this, I'll be talking a little bit more about DivaBetic. But right now, we've launched uh, a video series, our radio show, a lot more social media contacts, so we could have more uh, conversations with all of you. And um, my name, again, is Mr. Diabetic. I normally outreach to women at risk affected by and living with diabetes. I've had the incredible opportunity of traveling around the country, talking to um, thousands of women about their diabetes as well as their loved ones. And today, this webinar gives me a chance to reach men as well. So I'm welcoming the men to the webinar. I know I've got a lot of divas from around the country. I've been to New Orleans, um, uh, Cleveland, Los Angeles. Los Angeles, and I started because I worked for Luther Vandross for 13 years as personal assistant, and uh, Divabetic is really about being outspoken about your diabetes because Luther had a stroke in 2004. I found him uh, in his house, and I rushed him to the hospital, and that's when I found out that Luther's stroke was related to his diabetes, and it could have been prevented. And the reason it could have been prevented, Brian, is because Luther uh, – had 50 people supporting him with his music, but when it came to managing his diabetes, he did alone. And I think that was a mistake in where these conversations end in the doctor's office. So we're going to go into the doctor's office today and talk about how to have that conversation with your doctor, but you definitely want to reach out after you go to the doctor and start engaging more of your friends and family in your care. And that's what being a diabetic is all about, and that's what our site is all about. And so I've kind of taken that opportunity and traveled around the country out of the clinical setting, as Brian said. I'm, I'm the guy you meet at different events around the country to talk to women in a more casual atmosphere so they could have real conversations with medical health care uh, professionals, uh, certified educators, and get some of the answers they need. But when I've been traveling around, uh, one question keeps coming up. People continue to have problems with their doctors. They're always looking for new doctors. They're having, uh, they don't know what doctor to talk to. Uh, they don't know, um, they're unhappy with their progress. They feel they're frustrated, they're angry. And so that's why I really came to you guys, Clinic Labs, and said, let's do a webinar all about how do we engage the patient with the doctor. Or nurse practitioner. Or the nurse practitioner. Or a PA. And the PA is? The PA is a physician's assistant, which in most states, can do exactly the same thing I can. You can work independently and do almost everything a doctor can do, and you certainly can take care of diabetics. Um, one of the things that nurses do, probably more than anybody else, is diabetes education. In every single hospital in the United States, 
there are, there's at least one, but there's usually multiple diabetes educators because this is something that people don't know about. And the more you know, the more empowered you're going to be. So nurses are great at teaching. That's something we've been doing since the beginning of time. Someone broke their leg, a nurse helped them fix it, and then taught them how to use the crutches. Well, this is the exact same thing. A nurse can teach you about your diabetes, and that's why I'm here. I'm a nurse first, but I'm also a nurse practitioner, so I know about the medications, I know about the ordering, and I certainly know about the conversations. So nurses can be a real resource. Don't ever think that just because a nurse can't write a prescription that they can't help you. They really can. And a certified diabetes educator, as you mentioned, could be a registered nurse or a registered dietitian who also goes on and uh, has to take uh, has to do like 2,000 hours in the field talking to a variety of patients living with diabetes to get credentialed with that certified diabetes educator credential that they would add to their title. Also, a master's of social work, I believe, can be a certified diabetes educator. Yeah, which is not easy. You know what I mean? These people really know what they're talking about. Well, they about. have all the information, so now it's a matter of how do these patients get the information out of their doctors as well as their nurses when they're technically the average doctor appointment is only seven minutes long. Yeah. So you got your work cut out for you. And, you know, part of this is about, uh, before we go forward, we want to, Brian and I were discussing earlier just about accepting your diabetes, the fact that one of the first roadblocks to even before you're able to talk to your doctor is how are you talking about your diabetes to your friends and your family, as well as yourself. And I know personally uh, that many women are very angry and frustrated. They are very uncertain. Today, I think 80% of all people who are diagnosed with diabetes are di diagnosed in a hospital setting, and it's usually uh, not why they went to the hospital. So they go in for another treatment or condition, and they walk out with diabetes. And so then they're very uncertain about why do I have diabetes? Was it because I just had an operation on my foot or I had uh, heart issues? Is it because, you know, is, I know a woman who had a um, malpractice suit. Something went wrong in the hospital and she was diagnosed with diabetes. So she has a lot of anger and frustration and it has really hampered her care. Yeah. So have you ever heard about these obstacles? Oh my God, all the time. And, and, and really, I, I would bet that it's higher than 80%. People don't go don't come to me and say, Brian, I have diabetes. I, I don't feel good. I'm pretty sure I have diabetes. Let's find out why. It's almost always for something else. It's a heart attack. It's I fainted. Um, you know, my heart feels like it's pounding out of my chest. It's something else. And then we find out that they have diabetes. And and it's hard to accept because it's the last thing on your mind. You know, you, 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 you fainted. You were rushed to the hospital. You thought, God knows what, but it, it sure wasn't that you had diabetes. So sometimes it, it takes a while um, to understand that you have diabetes, uh, but the more you learn, the more you can kind of understand and accept the fact that it doesn't mean you're going to be injecting yourself, you know, 25 times a day with a needle. Sometimes it means you're going to take one pill a day. Sometimes it means that you're going to maybe adjust your diet and, and, and try and get a little more exercise. There are a lot of people who can manage their diabetes with diet and exercise. Um, and it's taking a positive, you know, it, 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 it's keeping a positive attitude that's going to help you manage your care better. Well, I think you brought up an important point about uh, needle phobia. If you, if you only assume, if you're assuming that diabetes or being diagnosed with diabetes means that you're going to have to prick yourself millions of times throughout the week, month, year, you might not want to be diagnosed. And that could be a huge fear. I know a woman who came to our program in D.C. who uh, was affected by diabetes, and she came to get diabetes education because everyone in her family had diabetes, had lost a foot, leg, had suffered some kind of amputation. And she wanted to know, was she, you know how could she stop from losing her foot, which was interesting that she went that far to be that honest about it. But obviously these these huge hurdles and people, these fears create hurdles for people. And so when you go to the doctor's office, you could be scared because you don't even want to talk about how to better manage your care if you know there's a needle at one side of it yeah. or you know that, you know, there's a potential to lose a limb, uh, blindness, and such on. Well, and here's another thing is just let, – let's, let's give an example. Let's say that you – we'll stick with the passed out. I passed out. I got taken to the hospital. It turns out that I have diabetes, and 
when you pass out, it's probably because your blood sugar is very high or very low. Mm -hmm. And you may very well need to get an injection of some kind, either some sugar or some insulin at first to help control this acute illness. But once you get past that acute phase, you may never need to be on insulin again. It may be very possible for us to transfer you to oral agents, pills, and be able to manage your diabetes um, very, very conservatively. And it's just that acute phase that you have to get over. So just because you got insulin one time does not mean you're going to get insulin forever. And, and But there are several people, my brother being one of them, who are type 1, uh, living with type 1 diabetes, and they're always going to be injecting insulin. And that's still, uh, you could still lead a healthy, productive life with Absolutely. Ab I, I'll, I'll tell a little story. Back in the day, not well, I guess it wasn't wasn't too far back in the day, but for me it was back in the day, about eight years ago. I used to work in Oregon. I worked in an intensive care unit, and my dream was to be an intensive care unit doctor. And it was because I worked with these five, there's only five guys that were intensive care doctors in Salem, Oregon at the time. And they were super cool. Like, I did everything on ER. You know, you shock people, you do the chest compressions, and these guys were in the room calling the shots, being like, do this, do this, grab me that. You know, and they were, I mean, they were my idol. And it was about a year and a half later that I found out that one of them was a type 1 diabetic. My favorite guy, Dr., well, I guess I shouldn't say his name, Dr. S, we'll call him, was a, a type 1 diabetic. He had an insulin pump, and it was, he didn't even tell me. He just was doing chest compressions one time, and his shirt kind of rode up, and I saw this insulin pump, and I was like, oh, my God. Dr. S is a type 1 diabetic, and I started talking to him about it, and he led a completely normal, incredibly productive life with type 1 diabetes, and you would never know. You would never know about it. He never complained about it. It, it didn't seem like he was eating anything terribly different. He led a completely normal life. I was really amazed. All right. Well, we're going to move on, but first, we have a question. In terms of privacy, I'm a when I specifically make an appointment, Brian, to see and talk to my doctor, who, by the way, I have researched thoroughly and end up seeing his physician assistant instead. No offense to physician mm -hmm. assistants, but how can I demand to see my actual doctor, or should I just choose to see a new doctor? I think that's a good start that, question. That is a good start question. Um, I'm going to think about this just for a minute. Um, well, we'll keep it, going it, it, forward, and then we'll get back to them. Well, here, let me let me address it. You have every right to be offended. If 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 that's the way it's made you feel, then that's the way it's made you feel. And I think if, if you're offended, you have every right to say, "Oh, I, you know." I, it, it, it helps to keep it together. You know, you don't want to fly off the hand and be like, you know, you need to very calmly say, I made an appointment with Dr. Smith. I was not told that I would be seeing you today. I had questions specifically for Dr. Smith. I'm comfortable with Dr. Smith, and I'd like to talk to Dr. Smith. Um, that being said, with the average visit being seven minutes, a lot of places are going to hire PAs, physician assistants, uh, and a lot of times they're going to book you with them without telling you. And what's the dialogue? Go to, go into the other room for us with this person specifically. What's the dialogue between a physician's assist, assistant and a doctor after an appointment? Do I see if I see the physician assistant? Is there a thorough um, follow up between the my doctor and the physician's assistant to discuss my case, or am I strictly now under the care of this physician assistant? It depends. There, there, there isn't one answer. There, there, are, there can be and there cannot be. If the, if the physician's assistant sees you and you've already been assessed, I know what's, what's going on, um, and you're coming back for medication refills, uh, you don't have any specific complaints, um, then there really would not be a reason for the physician's assistant to have a conversation about your case with the right, with, but if I'm a new, doctor, I feel like she or he is saying I'm a new patient, and we're going to move on from this topic. It seems yeah. to me like if I'm a new patient and I'm and I really did my research, and I want to see Dr. Smith because he's the expert, and then you know you, someone else walks in, I might want to just try a new doctor because that's not going to really give me 
the yeah. personal care, she or he who, who uh, thank you for this uh, question, brought up, maybe they need to look into another. Yeah, doctor. and I would say that you have every right to say, I would like to see Dr. Smith. Uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily take it as a no. If you, if you're very calm about it, and say, I, you know, I, I would say it just like that. I did my research. I came to you specifically because I looked you up, Dr. Smith, and I want to talk to you about my diabetes because you know what? Other people have said you're very good. I mean, kill them with kindness, and I bet you dollars to donuts that you'll be the next person Dr. Smith sees. So stand up for yourself. You know, it, it does not hurt to ask. Well, and you say right at the end of the slide, you have to fight for your time. You Absolutely. Start fighting right now. Absolutely. That. All right, so here we're going to go, to, we're going to walk everyone through a doctor's appointment uh, ahead of time. Okay. You know, because a lot of women and a lot of men out there living with diabetes tend to treat their doctor's appointment like lo dropping off their laundry. And so you got to have a little bit, especially when managing your diabetes, and we talked a little bit before we got on this call about how overwhelming the terminology can be. Uh, not only with your body, but the technology out there, how many, how much chaos and clutter there is in the marketplace is where you're getting your information from. So a lot of times, you know, it is important to sit down ahead of time and kind of get a goal plan going. And the idea for my goal for wanting to take on this topic, I wanted to mention this earlier, was because I want to help people today become better self-managers, and we want to improve the conversation or the dialogue between a doctor and a patient, because this is really... I think we agree that your doctor is really the quarterback on your team for managing your care under your direction, uh, listeners. But, you know, this is a person that you really need to be uh, discussing your game plan with. So we really want to help you improve that conversation in order for you then to take that conversation forward and improve the quality of your life. So um, simple things you want to write down, just like we we're saying here, are the reasons you want to have the visit. Uh, when the last time is you saw your doctor, and now we're going to get more specific. But this is not something you don't want to sit down and think about your upcoming visit while you're in the parking lot. You probably want to do it a no. few days out. Day and, before, you know, how about the morning of? You know, it, 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 I, I would call it cramming for a test, you know. Maybe it's good to cram for a test. You might get a good grade on it. You might have a good conversation, but you might not remember what you were talking about. So prepping a day in advance, you know, writing down a list of questions or a list of symptoms, and then coming back to it the next day, giving it some more thought before you go into your doctor's appointment is going to make it stick. You know what I mean? It, 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 because believe me, your doctor is going to be keeping notes of what you guys talked about last time. So you can do exactly the same thing. I think um, also we're talking, we're getting into like talk, when we're thinking about this, about talking about specific symptoms. And a lot of times people seem to ignore the most uh, common ones. Or the, and we were talking earlier, because this is Clinton Labs, about uh, sleep apnea yeah. and the symptoms around sleep apnea. So sleep apnea, what is sleep apnea? Um, sleep apnea, I'll give you a definition. I hate giving definitions. The definition of sleep apnea is when during sleep you stop breathing. Apnea is is no breathing and sleep is while you're asleep. Um, what it usually looks like is snoring, 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 then a little bit of a pause, and then snoring again. Uh, and that pause is where your snoring was actually so bad that it didn't even make sound anymore. It just stopped your breathing. Um, and people with sleep apnea actually usually have... Um, a worsening of their diabetes. Uh, it doesn't mean that everybody with diabetes has sleep apnea or that everybody with sleep apnea has diabetes. But I can tell you that if you do have diabetes and you have untreated sleep apnea, it can really hurt. So if your partner, if your wife or your husband or your boyfriend or your girlfriend says, you know, honey, you're snoring, you know, is giving you the elbow, giving you the turnover on your side, uh, it could be worthwhile to talk to your doctor about it. And snoring could be a, as a symptom. I mean, qualifies under symptoms. What we're trying to say is, like, some of these symptoms, we, we all think they have to be major issues, and this could just be a normal pattern in your life. You're not sleeping that many hours each night. You tend to be snoring because your partner has let you know that. That could be a change in your sleep pattern. 
and so you want to write those things down as symptoms, Absolutely. along with the other ones about getting drowsy, right, in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, blurry like, vision. Blurry vision. Um, loss of appetite. How about when you wake up, you are out of breath? I mean, some people ha are having a dream and they wake up out of breath. Um, but some people wake up all the time out of breath, and they think that that is just normal. See, unfortunately, what happens is, is when these things sneak up on you gradually, you don't even realize it. You just think that it's normal to wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning every morning panting, and it's not. So how would your game plan be about these symptoms? Do you just keep a notebook by the bed or something that you would write in? That would be good. I, I mean, I, I honestly don't think that that's going to happen that often, but if, if you can just write down write down the symptoms because I'll tell you what, during that seven minute visit and when someone when the doctor asks you, you know, what what's wrong? Why are you here? Or I mean it's usually a nurse who asks you that beforehand anyway. But if you have this list of symptoms written down on an in a notepad, even on a sticky note, that is going to help you so much because you're not going to be stumbling over your words. You're not going to be like trying to tell a story. Mm -hmm. You just all you have to do, you can literally just hand them the piece of paper. Hey, you know I get sleepy in the afternoon, I wake up 20 times a night out of breath, and my, you know, boyfriend tells me that I snore all the time. And now this is interesting because you have a way, you were telling me earlier, there's a language that doctors use to review my symptoms. So as a patient, if I do have a symptom, I, if I learn the language, which Brian's going to go through right now on this slide that I just posted, we're going to learn how to talk about a symptom in the, the way a doctor talks about a symptom right. so that we could, again, help you bridge this kind of language barrier that might be happening. Okay. So we're taking sleep. Okay. We're, we're taking that as our symptom. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. So we'll, we'll take sleep as a symptom. And doctors, nurse practitioners, PAs, they're all taught exactly the same way how to ask questions about a particular complaint. So the PQRST is a, is a mnemonic, and it's a way to ask patients about either a symptom or pain, uh, but we'll use it to talk about sleep. So P stands for palliative or provocative, which means does anything make it better or does anything make it worse? So with sleep, it could be, you know, uh, does it help if you sleep with a couple more pillows behind your back? Does it help if you go to bed earlier or later? Lights on, lights off? Uh, all sorts of different things can actually mean something to us. If you're sleeping with six pillows behind your back every night and you can't sleep laying flat, there's actually a term for that. It's called orthopnea, And it means that you literally need to be sitting up in order to sleep. So if I were a patient and putting this into patient speak, okay. then I would this P would stand for, I'm not sleeping much, but when I do sleep, I'm finding that with a third pillow, I'm sleeping more. Better. Better. I'm sleeping better. Yeah. Okay. So now yeah. Q. What makes it better or worse? Q is quality. So, um... That's hard because we're relating yeah, to pain. Yeah, that's but, hard for sleep, right. but uh, deep sleep, you could say, I, I sleep really quality, shallow every time. Switching topics, quality of pain, let's relate that to neuropathy because a lot of people oh. have that tingly in their fingers and their feet. And so this would be, how do we talk about that? Like we have to really, as a patient, identify what that sensation is? Use whatever comes to your mind first. If your hands feel numb, say my hands or feel numb. Or cold. Cold. Prickly. Um, prickly, uh, burning, a lot of, I hear a lot of burning. You know, I, I had this burning sensation in my feet. Uh, I've heard that a lot as well yeah. from women. Now, you know, it, that's great. The neuropathy is great because, uh, you know, with diabetes, that's going to be one of the things we think of first. But you should rule out other things, too. It could be peripheral vascular disease. It could be athlete's foot. It could be a lot of different. It could be you wear heels too much. Um, but it's something we should explore together. Uh, but using those words help. Well, you know, uh, doctors are trained to decipher those words. So use whatever comes to you first and stick to your guns. If, it, if you think it feels cold, say it feels cold. And let, the, let your doctor do the detective work to figure out what that means. Okay, so then our region of the body that CZ just talked about, if we're suffering from neuropathy, we're talking about are you feeling it in your fingers? 
Are you, are you feeling in your feet? What part of your fingers and feet are you feeling, uh, hands and feet are you feeling it in, correct? Absolutely. Is, Absolutely. And is that important to identify, I feel it in the ball of my foot or I feel it in my heel? Or even better is, do you feel it in both feet? Do you feel it in one foot versus the other or just your hands or just your feet? Because if you feel it in all four, boom, bingo. Ding, 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 neuropathy. It's not, it's not just one hand or one foot. Because then I'm going to look at that foot specifically and say, all right, it's, it's got to be something here. But if you're saying I feel it in my fingertips and in my toes, then I, I as the provider, I'm going to say, all right, we're looking for something nervous system related or something vascular, uh -huh. something that's going to affect the whole body. So that type of region thing really matters. And this is also great advice for a caregiver because they could be treating an adult parent or a child, and these are things you want to talk to that patient about, you know, the person you're caring for yeah. and ask. And then They're you could go to the doctor's work, uh, visit with them and kind of have these things written down ahead of time if, if you feel proactive. I just want to interrupt for one second. I'm going to go on to ask, which I'm, you know, the severity of pain on a scale of 1 to 10. I'm sure the person who just uh, emailed me is having some uh, severity of pain because they want to get an answer on this question. So <laughs> as soon as we get through this slide, we're going to get back to you. But while we're here, uh, if you're suffering from neuropathy, let us know. I'm looking at the chat. Uh, people are chatting about their doctors right now. But let's talk a little bit about some of these um, issues you might have as far as symptoms, and we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about Brian about a specific issue. So now we're on to, uh, we've done P, we've done Q, we've done R, and now we're on to the severity of pain. It's usually on a scale of 1 to 10, you're saying? Absolutely. Um, a scale of 1 to 10, almost every, well, I'm going to say everybody should be using a scale of 1 to 10. That way I can judge over time. If I see you this week and you say my pain is a five and then I put you on a medicine and you come back a month from now and you say it's a three, we're not yet at zero, but at least I can tell we're making progress. Okay. And as long as we're using the same scale, got it. you know what I mean? Because mild, moderate, severe, you know, maybe you're five, you stay in mild, uh, you know, I, just from a, a anecdotal experience, women have a much higher tolerance for pain than men. I'll tell you that right now. And they put up with a lot more. So a lot of women will come in and say, you know, yes, my feet are bothering me, but it's not that, but, you know, don't worry about it. Do worry about it. You know what I mean? Because it could, it, you know, the tipping point is going to be just, the, you know, we don't want it to get to the tipping point. We want to treat it up front because being proactive is what this is all about. Mm -hmm. So and now, severity pain, 1 to 10 scale, stick with it. Timing of pain. This is interesting to me. I don't think a lot of people talk about the time of their pain. Okay. They say my feet hurt. Okay. And when? So, what, now, this mean, is what time of day? Right. Is it is it when you is it because you've been on your feet all day working and uh, you know there's there's something to think of that if if you have been laying in bed all night and you just got eight hours of the most restless sleep of your life and you wake up and you have this numbness and tingling in your feet and in your hands, all four of them equally the same, that is, that is ringing a bell to me. But if it's fine when you wake up, but then you go to work and you've been either walking all day or sitting at a desk all day, and then it's only that your feet hurt, I'm thinking something else. My mind is not going to neuropathy. It's going to edema or poor circulation or swelling of your feet, you know, it's not going through neuropathy. So the timing really can lead me to two very different diagnoses. All right. So uh, I, I think we're going to post this both on our site so people could write down the PQRST if you want um, and hold on to that for your records and, and use that. Seems like a great piece of advice for people yeah. about looking at symptoms as they come up. And I know most people living with diabetes are seeing their their doctors on a three month cycle. Okay. So there's time within that you know, between visits that something might arise and those are kind of great guidelines to do that. Uh, and they're just things that you know, you don't have to have an answer for every single one. No, and you know, this you know? tackles the next question about just being prepared with a list of questions and concerns. Specifically, if you have a symptom, like you're saying, and you write all this stuff down, that's probably going to be the question you're going to be talking the most about. And again, around neuropathy, because you said so many people experience that slight burning, 
tingling sensation. It's very uncomfortable. For, a lot of people can't sleep when they have these uh, symptoms, and so that would probably be a top priority. But even in a routine visit, just to go back to what we were talking about earlier with the sleep apnea, yeah. it's something that's just interesting to make a note of because it could lead to some, that snoring could be a symptom of something else, and a lot of people are not putting two and two together. I well, and, it, and it's, and it's a, you know, maybe we're not going to tackle it today. Maybe it's something that you bring up, but I have more pressing concerns like managing your blood sugars. And so for this visit, we're going to tackle your diabetes meds. We're going to make a few changes. And then next time when you come back, I look at your log. Everything looks great. I'm really happy with your blood work. I'm happy with your blood sugars. And now I'm going to say, well, you know, tell me more about, you know, this snoring that you had last time. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe next time we'll have time to explore it. But at least you got it out there. At least you right. got it out on the table, and we can talk about it maybe next time. Right. Uh, so uh, jumping back just for one second to the slide before, when you, you're kind of addressing, you know, how do I talk to my doctor? When you're in a doctor's office, it's great to have that list because those seven-minute visits, uh, people are going to want to tackle one thing. If you go in there saying, you know, uh, I need to talk to you about my blood sugars, but also, uh, you know, I'm having uh, headaches and uh, I threw up three days ago. Those are three very different problems that probably are not related, and they're going to pick the most important one and deal with that. So, but at the same time, they might write they, down they all could. three in their chart. They, they will, like they will said, definitely we'll write them about, all down. We'll talk about the headaches next month, right, or whenever. So right. it is kind of a great. That is a great tip. Have the list. Kind of write down at least five. You know, whatever one to five or something that you could go in and it, when you start the visit, just start right here are the five things I want to talk about today. You know, Dr. Smith, let's go from there. I like that. And I'm sure this is going to be on that top five list is your medications. Oh, my God. And we're talking about why, you know, listing medications. A lot of people are just thinking about prescription medications. But, Brian, we both know a lot of people take vitamins and they take supplements. Right. And they even take something called Trim Spa. Trim Spa. Kim oh Kardashian is promoting Trim Spa. Now, I'm curious, like a diet pill yeah. over the counter I could get it basically anywhere. I think I could get it at Walgreens, Walmart, uh, Dwayne Reed. Why would anyone, why would my doctor need to know I'm on the trim spa? Okay, so uh, why would your doctor need to know you're on trim spa? Or why would I even list, write it? We're saying list it with our, you know. Right. Things that you take over the counter are just as important as things that are prescribed for you. Uh, and the reason they are is because you may not. You may very well not know what's in it. Trim Spa. Um, when we started talking about it earlier, I was very honest with you, and I told you, you know what? I don't really know exactly what it is. I'm going to look it up. The first thing I'm going to do when I hear that you're on Trim Spa is I'm going to Google it. I'm going to Google Trim Spa, and I'm going to find out what the active ingredient is. Is it that it's caffeine, and that it causes you know an increased metabolism, so I, you know I actually burn more things? Is it um, is it sugar? I mean, Trim Spa, for all I know, could be some sort of concentrated sugar pill, which for a diabetic is like the worst thing you could possibly take. And these supplements is really what, I mean, Trim Spa would be considered a supplement, and they can be just as helpful or harmful as a prescription medication. Do you, do you recommend bringing the actual product to your doctor? Absolutely. Why not? Just bring in the bottle. You you can write it down. That that works too. But if if you have if you know what I love more than anything is when someone brings me a shopping bag full of everything they take. They just take their little pill box and bring it in with them because I believe that I I, I you know when people whip out the shopping bag and say here here's the eight bottles I take I take two of these in the morning I take one in the afternoon I I love that. I, I mean, some people don't, but personally, I feel like that is more the best of a complete thing to do. picture. Because it tells me, yeah, this is this is what was on the person's coffee table, and, and that's you know what they did. So, um, it's good to make a list. The list is very important, especially for safety reasons. You should always have a list with you, and I think that's one of the slides that I you know I made for coming up. 
Uh, well, <laughs> I'm working you know. with you today. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. So the most important thing that you can do is to always have a list of these medications with you. And share it with all of your doctors, not yeah. just your general practitioner. Oh my but God. You, want to, you want to make sure every doctor is aware of what this doctor is prescribing. I have, some of the women I work with are seeing multiple doctors in their entourage, so they want to keep talking about to each doctor and, and informing them about what they're taking right. and, and so they could see how these all link together. And i tell you another thing you can do that's very important I forgot to put up in this slide. Get all of your medications at the same pharmacy because pharmacists are very, very good about looking for medication interactions. Uh, there are a lot of things out there that interact with one another, and believe me, the best person for knowing about that is a pharmacist. That's what they do all day long. So that's a great tip to keep trying to try to go to the same pharmacist, whether it's the one near your office that's more convenient yep. or the one near your home. And there are some pharmacies that will give you a list. That, that part of their little computerized tip type thing is it will print out a list of medications that you can just slip into your purse. Um, having that list of meds is, is I mean, you know, it, it's like the new age medical alert bracelet. I mean, we still do medical alert bracelets. Not that many people do. But the first thing a nurse does when an un unconscious person comes into the emergency room is I dive into that purse and I, I find what's in there. You know, I look for that list of meds. I look, I mean, you know, Paramedics are trained to look on the refrigerator to find the list of meds. Okay. And it, it, it is invaluable. Uh, I don't want to scare people, but, um, you know, medication reactions or interactions uh -huh. can be incredibly, incredibly dangerous. Um, there are certain medications, especially used for diabetes, um, where you have to be very careful about what you give with them. Uh, How would someone know that then? We're going to we're going to research. So someone, if someone's curious about that, would you recommend going to Google? Um, talking to your doctor. Well, the, going the, to the main one that the main one that um, I want to bring up is IV contrast. Um, IV contrast is what we use when we take a CT scan. You know, you get a CT of your head or your hip or whatever. Uh, IV contrast cannot be given with certain diabetes medications. So okay. when you're taking pills for your diabetes, um, you can have IV contrast, but it, you just have to stop taking the pills for two days beforehand. Okay. Drink lots of water, flush it out of your system, and then you can get contrast. But if you give the two together, it can really hurt your kidneys. So that's why we need the list. Because if, if you're unconscious, how are you going to tell us? Right. You know what I mean? So that's why we make a list. But then, all, but also about this, about looking at medications. Now we're taking as a self, as a, a better self manager of our care, we're going to start doing research about what's on that list. We're going to go and check out Trim Spa, and then bring the bottle as well as the research why we think it's a great product for us or why we don't. And we were talking earlier about Bayada Genuvia. You know, there's certain types of medications that we've been seeing a lot in popular magazines, they take out full page ads or commercial breaks during our favorite TV shows. Sure. So the best way to, you know, some of these um, pharmacy, pharmaceutical companies who own these are doing a, a really broad campaign. They're going onto sites and buying out more information on them. So how would you know, like, if uh, product X is good for you? you recommend, what would you recommend doing, Brian? So I have two recommendations. Um, one is read blogs, uh, talk to other people who are going to do the same thing you are and see what they think. You know, get advice. Uh, I, I, I think what Max here is doing is great because there's nothing more powerful than a group of people. You know what I mean? Talk to each other and see how it's going. The other thing is look at, look at, you can Google every medication you take. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Because I'll tell you, if you go to Genuvia.com, they're going to talk about all the good things about Genuvia and why you should take it and how you should talk your doctor into prescribing mm -hmm. Genuvia for you. And Genuvia could be a great drug for you. I'm not saying it's not, but it's not necessarily objective, you know. So you want to have you want to go to blogs and look for patients who might be similar to you, right? Absolutely. Age, gender. 
uh, type 1, type 2, obviously. How long have I been a diabetic? What else am I taking? And find out what their firsthand experience was with it, whether it was uh, no, no effect, some effect, bad effect, and then go to your doctor and kind of play, you know, uh, review this with your doctor again. Yeah. Especially because a lot of people do get into these roadblocks over the years of living with diabetes and they're searching for new ways to improve their health. There's great messaging out there in the world with new products, new technologies. So this would be the way to start doing it, yeah. to go online and start looking at these blogs. Well, and go online, look at the blogs. Don't, don't be afraid to Google things. You know, you're a lot – I mean, you can make these decisions for yourself. I, I spoke to a patient today who I had a question for him about something totally non-related to his diabetes. Um, it was actually a question about an EKG thing, and I was talking to him for about two minutes, and he said, Brian, you know, um, I just asked him, you know, how's your diabetes doing? He goes, yeah, bad. I, I, I'm, I'm up at 270, 300 all the time. Um, you know, I'm checking in actually while I'm talking to you on the phone, uh, 314. At 10 o'clock in the morning, the guy had been fasting all night. It was 314. And I said to him, well, how long... Has it been like this since I saw you last? And I looked at the chart, and it was June. And I thought, oh my God, you are you're coming in tomorrow. You know, I'm making an appointment for you, and I'm going to see you on Thursday morning. And I, I couldn't see him tomorrow. It's going to be Thursday. But I thought, why have you been sitting there for going on two full months now right. without telling me this? I can't do anything unless you tell me what's going on with you. So speak up. Initiate. Call me. You know how much I can do over the phone? I can call the pharmacy. I can have stuff delivered to you. You don't even have to come in for a full visit. I can make something happen in 10 minutes instead of waiting three months and letting this stuff just simmer. And I'm a, you know. Uh, You're a busy nurse practitioner. I'm a busy nurse practitioner. Yeah, and, and I'm doing these research things. I'm doing these EKG things. But you know what? The, the thing that I care about most is taking care of people. And when I think of this guy sitting at home for two months with blood sugars of 300 and 350, I'm pissed at myself. You know what I mean? I'm, uh, I, I'm pissed that he didn't think that he could call me and say, hey, this is what's going on. Let's do something about it. Well, I think that gets back to what we were um – Sometimes, someone just wrote in saying, sometimes I don't even think I'm really diabetic. And that's a perfect <laughs> lead into learning more. You know, we don't, you know, we don't know if we're really diabetic or not because sometimes we don't understand the terminology. I mean, there, you know, and sometimes you, these doctors throw around these words that are a little bit overwhelming. So here we have like five words that we both agreed on were kind of difficult for people. Yeah. Brian, walk us through these uh, quickly because then we're going to save some time for some of these questions. I know we've got about about 15 more minutes to the webinar. Uh, keep emailing us your questions right now on the chat. I'm seeing them pop up. I'm watching it. So here we go. Hemoglobin A1C, Brian, what is that? Okay, hemoglobin A1C is a measure of your, your average blood sugar over the last three months. Is that important? Absolutely. It is the most, well, it's the second most important thing. And what's the scale of an A1C? The scale of an A1C is in percentage. So it can be anywhere from or uh, anywhere up to, well, it can be up to 100. It wouldn't be, but I've seen them in as high as 12, 13, 14, 15 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, the goal for most diabetes care is less than 7. We, and, want, we, want, we want you to be less than 7 percent. And it's, those percentages align with blood glucose values. So right. if you get a 7 or an 8, you, look, you could go ask your doctor for what does that mean on the number on my meter. A lot of people look at it as a separate number and don't realize that, you know, a 6.5 is considered... 6.5 uh, is about 100 and... Uh, I want to say 180, 160 to 180 maybe? No, 6.5 is like a normal blood uh, glucose reading, so it's about 100. It's, it's 5 is about 100 plus 5 for every point. So okay. 50 for every point. So it could be 100 and... Well, they can go to diabetes.org. You can go to diabetes.org. Or you know what you can do? Anybody who's in, who's on there, you should all be on your computer right now. You can type, go, in, go to Google and type in A1C conversion. And you'll find how to convert it. 
and convert and, and send it to us right now. Well, we yeah. got some A1C. Somebody find A1C conversion for 6.5. And let us know. I'd let us know. I'm right. going to say it's about 160. CBG, capillary blood glucose. It's, I can't read the third word, so I'm assuming that's that what it is? Oh, yes, capillary blood glucose. So that is what you measure when you prick your finger and you put the little blood on the machine. That's how you measure your blood sugar, capillary blood glucose. And what's the next? Osmotic diuresis. Um, that's a fancy way of saying I pee a lot because I have diabetes. Uh, okay. It, 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 it's caused, I can explain, it's a very complicated mechanism and we don't have a lot of time. But basically, when you have high blood sugar, your body's way of fighting that is by peeing out the sugar. So. Um, that's what it is, osmotic diuresis. And renal impairment. Renal impairment. Uh, diabetes affects every body system you have, and one of them that it affects the most is your kidneys. Your kidneys' job is to filter your blood, and diabetes is uh, basically a disease of having too much sugar in your blood. And so all that sugar kind of clogs up the filter, and that's what your kidneys are. They're two big filters and they are impaired by all the sugar that's being filtered through them. Okay, and now finally the last one. Vasculitis uh, slash ophthalmologic dysfunction. Uh, same thing. Your eyes, uh, your eyes are affected by diabetes, and they're affected because you have very, very, very small blood vessels in your eyes. Uh, if you've ever looked at uh, if you've ever been to the ophthalmologist and seen the little instruments that they use, they use little itty bitty instruments and big microscopes to do anything with your eyes. And so when blood tries to flow through those little itty bitty vessels in your eyes and there's extra sugar in there, it screws up the blood vessels. All right. So now we're moving on. Thank you for clarifying some of those terms. If you have a term that you don't understand, now is the best time to send it in to us. So uh, don't forget to be honest. This person really captured me with this. I'm not sure. Sometimes I don't even feel I'm diabetic. So if someone really gave you that response, like sometimes I don't feel I'm diabetic, yeah. we could go to symptoms with this. Like why, you know, are you, I mean, they could go, they would come see you, probably ask why. They would if they showed their blood glucose logbook and showed you that their, their numbers weren't really changing, as well as made a connotation with when I exercise, it doesn't go down. When I'm eating foods, it's not changing. Then there could be, I don't, I don't know if this would be true or not, but I mean, if, if we were, this is someone being honest, that they don't think they're living with diabetes. So. Well, here's the thing. is There is such a thing as transient diabetes. There's, there's gestational diabetes, so some women, uh -oh, when wait. they're pregnant, Here's a clear, you did very well. Here's a clarification, but my doctor is treating me for it. My A1C is always either 5.9 to 6.2. Okay. My morning glucose reading is rarely over 115. I'm, I'm on precose only. I eat pretty much what I want in small amounts, and I don't exercise. I'm not sure I like that, but that's okay. <laughs> what is my likelihood that I will die from the disease? Do you have a family history? I want to know if they have a family yeah, history as well. Family I also history. think... You know, um, Do you have any other medical problems? Other medical problems, family history, any other symptoms. Um, here's the thing: is that most people don't most people don't die of diabetes. Uh, you know, when we when we brought up in the beginning, uh, Luther Vandross didn't necessarily die of diabetes; he had a stroke. Yeah. Um, and then even then, it wasn't the stroke that necessarily was the final thing. It was complications from that. Right. So, um, you know, you can't ever, you know, point your finger at one thing and say, oh, oh, my God, it was the diabetes. But having uncontrolled diabetes, that's the other thing. And it sounds like if you do have diabetes, it's very, very well controlled. Um, this would be an interesting conversation for this person to have with their doctor, though, about why am I being treated this way? I don't, I'm kind of not sure if, I mean, are you telling me I am living with it or I'm not living with it? One of my biggest fears is like, is this going to kill me, which is probably why they're being so proactive. So, I mean, I kind of yeah. love how this person is helping us with this be honest, be honest, be honest, oh, yeah. and, and talking about something that might be slightly uncomfortable to get the, to get the answer, you know, the doctor potentially 
especially let's say you are living with diabetes, and then it goes back to the initial conversation about acceptance. But I appreciate this um, it's very honest. chat. Thank you for that. So uh, again, I love this point that you're making on this slide about they have to keep everything confidential. So a lot of times there's that doorknob conversation about sexual dysfunction. <laughs> Absolutely. No, people are very uncomfortable about talking about sexual dysfunction. They don't want to, everyone to know about it. Right. So that is really in a room with a doctor. You can't have that conversation. And I do think there's a lot of um, comfort in that statement for someone who's having that. Yeah. You know, the, the, the doctor-patient privilege, uh, doctor-patient confidentiality, it applies to doctors, nurses, PAs, uh, all of them. Uh, and what it means is if you say anything to a doctor, they cannot repeat it to anybody without your permission. Uh, so getting real and talking about this is an obstacle for me right now. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm not having, I'm not having I mean, sexual relationships this? with my partner. Yeah, what's the point of all this if you're not, you know, being happy in life? I think that's incredibly important. Bring it up. Uh, this woman or man who's emailing us said, yes, they do have a family history of the disease. So we'll talk about this at the end. But this is like, right here is a light bulb for a lot of people that I do programming with. It's the idea of bringing someone to the doctor's office with them. A lot of times it is an overwhelming experience. And so to have someone there taking notes, uh, even though we were talking about confidentiality uh, with your doctor, you might want to bring someone, especially on the initial visits with an early diagnosis, to understand the medications, to understand uh, the prescriptions, and especially if you're needle phobic, that could stop you from hearing anything. So you really want someone to write that stuff down for you initially when you're learning how to do insulin therapy. And they're there for you. You know what I mean? You're sort of on somebody else's turf when you're when you're picturing this conversation with your doctor. You're you're thinking this this kind of dark office with diplomas, and he's sitting there behind the big desk with the white coat. You know, you sort of feel like you're on their turf. And if you have someone with you, you feel a little bit stronger. You know what I mean? You feel a little bit more empowered. There's two of us. And you know, it's two against you. Yeah. Right. So uh, that can really, really, really help. I think it's a great idea. Uh, the next one was not to forget to ask questions, and we are getting email questions, so uh, we're going to hear them in a second. Good job, everybody. What can your doctor help you with? All right, so this slide, you guys, I'm not going to read it to you, but the gist of it is your doctor can help you with a lot more than you think. Um, just because you were referred to somebody for diabetes or you're seeing them for diabetes doesn't mean that that's all they can do. Uh, your doctor's a person. Uh, they can think critically. That's one of the biggest things that we do. And we can help you quit smoking. We can help you quit drinking. We can help you uh, eat better. Um, we can help you stop taking drugs or we can write you for drugs. Uh, but you have to be honest with us. Um, but sometimes, you know, like you're a very comforting person. A lot of times you could argue with your doctor. I could have an opinion. My doctor could have another opinion. Yeah. And specifically, I'm relating this to the question. Someone's very working very hard at losing weight. They're on a modified carbohydrate, high-protein diet, and they exercise. But they're still not able to lower the A1C. Uh, it's at a 9 right now. Her doctor's solution is to increase their insulin levels. We can't really discuss that because we can't give treatment over this webinar. But... Uh, her issue is like, how do I, how do, how do they, the, the person who's writing in, by the way, is saying that she's wondered if insulin is going to hamper her weight loss, or it could have hamper her weight loss, and then how does she answer these questions to her doctor if she happens to disagree with the approach? So if your doctor is telling you one thing, but in your heart of hearts, or there's a part of you that really is a doubting Thomas or doubting Tiffany, for this matter, <laughs> and you're going to start an ar argument with your doctor, some people don't even want to have that conversation. So can we, is it okay for us to argue with a doctor? Absolutely, 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 absolutely. You have every right to question every single thing that he or she does, and not only do you have the right, but you should. Um, well, how would you address this issue? Okay, I, would say, I would say, um, you know, his solution is to increase the, the, the insulin. The first thing I would say to you is, no, just increasing your 
insulin uh, intake is not necessarily going to hamper your weight loss. Um, that, and, 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 and the other thing is there's a reason that your doctor wants to increase your insulin. Now, I, like I said, I, I can't give specific advice over this webinar because I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know exactly. I don't know. If, uh, there's a lot of questions I would need to ask, but a lot of times, your doctor's number one priority is getting your diabetes controlled. Um, what's the point of losing weight if you end up in a coma in a hospital? Uh, now, absolutely, losing weight is great. It, it helps with your diabetes. It helps with your self-confidence, with your overall health, with your energy levels, all kinds of things. But if, if your doctor feels that your blood sugars are consistently too high, then that's going to be his priority. And he may very well say to you, look, your sugars are just too high. I have to get them down. And, you know, I'm not going to be able to do anything for you if, you know, your, if your sugars are too high. That that's my priority. So I hope that's a little bit helpful. Well, I think the idea of giving us permission to disagree with people is a big deal, especially with doctors, because I do think people are stymied when they feel like I have a different opinion than my doctor, and like you said earlier, he or she is in a lab coat, and so that could pr present a problem to um, ask you know, why. Trying to, we're trying to be polite patients, and the truth is, I guess we can't be polite all the time, can we? No. <laughs> I mean, how about how about just say be nosy? You know what I mean? Be nosy. Stick up for yourself. You know, that, 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 there's nothing wrong with sticking up for yourself. And it's only going to make your doctor think that, hey, I've got to really be on my toes with this woman because, you know what, she's going to call me out. She's going to go home and do her research. So. All right, we have time for one last question. And it, it was regarding someone wanted to say they didn't – first, um, the clinic I go to has resident doctors working there, and they rotate out often. Most of them are doing it for the first time. How can I get a senior doctor for all my visits? You can't. You can't. Um, but here's the thing. Residents always, there was that we, we talked earlier about does the PA have to go talk to the physician about my, my care? A PA doesn't, but a resident doctor always does. A resident doctor will always present your case to the attending, who is the senior doctor, and the attending will then tell the resident, Okay, I like your plan, or you need to do this instead. If That's you're, good news. It's, it's good news. It, it doesn't always feel that reassuring because you know they're kind of fumbling over uh, what question should I ask. I don't know what you know. The residents always have to present, um, so they have a lot of supervision, even if it doesn't seem like it. When you, you're talking to them, they always have to present your case to the attending, and the attending has to sign off. They I mean literally have to sign the chart and say that this is kosher. And the final word on this is that, you know, if you're seeing this kind of uh, change from one doctor to the next in each visit, you really do have to become the senior self-manager and keep notes in this new world we're living in with the new health care system. You need to be the one who's consistent between these appointments. And this is why, going back to how to talk to your doctor, why the whole seminar was created today, with webinar, excuse me, was to help you begin to get some tools to self-manage your doctor's visits in a way to help you better manage your life. Yeah, that's that, that's what the takeaway is that you, <laughs> the one consistent thing from appointment to appointment to appointment is always going to be you. And when someone comes in and sees me and says, "Hey, I feel like this," or "Hey, I need you to help me with this," or "My blood sugars have been X, Y, and Z," I listen to every word they say because nobody knows their diabetes better than themselves. Well, thank you all for tuning in for this webinar with Brian and myself. I'm Mr. Diva Bedek. You could go to our website, clinilabs.com. You're seeing that slide right now, or divabedek.org. I know we're going to follow up with extra questions that people had, so if you want to continue to uh, write those in, that would be great. And, again, we have another uh, webinar coming up a month from now. I'm not sure of the date, but yeah, we'll be post like 12. the 12th of September. Can yeah. going to be fall. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. and. Um, We'll be seeing you next month. Absolutely. Have a great day, guys.